right, thank you. All right, so let me uh, remind you of kind of the objects we've been studying. Uh, so if we have a gamma, a group, and then we had this continuous functions, uh, this boundary, which is small at infinity. So we had this, uh, this boundary that Ozawa introduced, uh, which we could identify as the set of functions in L infinity of the group, such that when you look at the difference after translating on the right, it's a comp, it's a C0 operator. T zero function, and this is for all T and gamma. And then we introduced two properties. One, we said that uh, the group gamma is by exact. If the action of gamma by left multiplication on the C star algebra or the spectrum of the C star algebra is amenable. And we said that gamma is properly proximal if there's no invariant state. So the action, or equivalently, there's no invariant probability measure on the spectrum. No variant state. And then we saw, so of course, from this definition, automatically, if you're bi-exact uh, and non-amenable, then you're also properly proximal. Um, uh, yeah. But we saw other examples as uh, from last time. In particular, we saw this example, which I wanted to continue uh, discussing today, that if we have a convergence group, so if group gamma axon K is a convergence action. Without invariant measures. So then gamma is properly proximal. And uh, let me now write out the whole definition again of a convergence action, but let me just draw the picture to remind you in case you've forgotten. So it has this north-south dynamic. So if you take any sequence Tn in your group and the Tn's uh, goes to infinity, so it escapes every finite set, then after passing to some subsequence, uh, you get this north-south dynamics where there's uh, the south pole down here, there's this north pole up here, and if you take any two neighborhoods, here A of A and B of B, then applying this transformation, uh, you're gonna move everything outside of A and it's gonna all kind of collapse near B. So it's, you know, you're kind of moving everything towards uh, B. So this is the transformation, you know, T and K for K large. Uh, so that's the picture to have in mind here. And the reason why we saw that this was uh, properly proximal is because if you take um, if you take eta any probability measure on K without atoms, then this condition that we have here exactly tells you that uh, applying this subsequence or every infinite sequence has a subsequence such that we converge in the weak star topology to a Dirac mass. So this says that, uh, that then we get that if we take eta um, and we subtract say S eta, so we just shift this, this gives us some other probability measure without atoms. And so now if we take any sequence in the group, uh, then we see that this limit here of the difference uh, converges weak star to zero because both the T eta's and the T S eta's converge to some Dirac mass, which is the same Dirac mass, only depending on the sequence T that you take. So we get that this weak star limit here as T goes to infinity is exactly zero, uh, which we saw before meant it was a factor of this uh, boundary that's small at infinity. 
Uh, and then uh, we saw the, the most natural example, the reason convergence groups are studied is specifically to try to generalize this uh, notion of this rank one phenomenon of SL2R acting on the uh, circle or the extended real line by fractional linear transformations. So of course this we can identify as a homogeneous subspace. This is SL2R uh, because of course SL2R acts transitive on the circle and so you can just look at the stabilizer of a point. Uh, so for instance, if you take the right points, you get this subgroup of all matrices that look like this. Uh, so, uh, so this is the type of phenomenon that they introduce convergence actions to generalize. Well, now I want to discuss what happens in the higher rank case. So in the higher rank case, you still have the action here. So uh, now let me carry this picture over to the next slide. So in the higher rank, rank case, if you say take gamma a lattice and SL3R, well, you can again, uh, so this is just the action uh, of SL2R on projective space. And so you again can consider this action. So you consider the action of SL3R on or gamma sitting inside SL3R. Uh, acting on projective space. Uh, so this is, say, projective real space in two dimensions. So this is the space of lines in uh, R3. Um, and uh, so this is given by matrix multiplication, which is, again, a homogeneous space. You can identify this. Since, again, SL3R acts transitively here, and you can identify identify this with the homogeneous space by fixing the stabilizer of a point. So for instance, if you stabilize the um, standard uh, unit basis vector, you get this subgroup, the upper triangulars. Oh, sorry, actually, sorry, not this is slightly larger, it's this one. So you get this subgroup here. So again, this is a homogeneous space uh, and it, it's just the action on projective space. So we want to see, is there, so this is not a convergence action and SL3R, um, yeah, is not a convergence group. It, it actually doesn't have any convergence action without invariant measures like SL2R does. Uh, however, it just does have some commonality with this type of property, uh, which you can understand a little bit by considering the KAK decomposition of SL3R. So, that is that SL3R has a decomposition, any simple Lie group uh, has a decomposition, the so-called KAK decomposition, where K is the maximal compact subgroup. So in SO3R, this is uh, SO3. And A is, in this case, going to be diagonal matrices, lambda one, lambda two, lambda three. Uh, such that the diagonal entries, and then we're going to have another copy of SO3, such that the diagonal entries are decreasing or non-increasing. In this way. So every, uh, every matrix in SL3R, uh, the way to see this decomposition is that if you have any matrix and SL3R, well, you can consider its polar decomposition. So uh, G is going to look like some V times some A, where A is a positive operator. But then we know three by three matrices, all positive operators are diagonalizable. So therefore, we can write this as V U V U star. And here are two unitaries or orthogonal transformations here. And the B is exactly this positive diagonal matrix here. Uh, so this is the KAK decomposition. And when you see this, then it's kind of nice. Uh, it's easy to see what's going on when you look at the action on projective space, because the SO3 part, these are just rotations. So they're just going to rotate projective space. 
And then the stretching uh, all comes from this middle term here, this diagonal matrix. And so specifically, if you look at what happens for the action on projective space, well, if you take any vector, so now if you take, say, a sequence or net of such GNs, so if you take GN and write them in this way, so you're going to have some AN or some K, KN, some lambda 1N, lambda 2N, lambda 3N, and some other KN. Well, if you take any sequence, then of course you can pass to a subsequence and assume that the KN and KN tildes converge because they live in this compact group. So we might as well assume that Kn converges to K and Kn tilde converges to some K tilde. And then uh, what's going to happen is now if we apply this Gn to any vector here, or really we want to look at the one dimensional subspace spanned by any vector, and we start applying this, you see, well, let's consider one case. So if this ratio of these two diagonal entries if this goes to infinity, then what this is, then applying this transformation, well, after applying K tilde, you're just going to make the first coordinate of V much, much larger than the second coordinate and much, much larger than the third coordinate because these are de decreasing. So you're blowing up the first coordinate of V when you apply this type of sequence. So what this means that if you have, any, if you have a sequence such that the ratio of the first two eigen, eigenvector, eigenvalues here goes to infinity, then you're going to exactly kind of collapse V to just, uh, so this Gn V, or at least Gn once you adjust for this K tilde, so if you do K tilde inverse V, uh, K, K inverse, so when you take the sequence, it's just going to collapse to this, uh, vector here, or the equivalence class, class of this vector. Here. So again, you see that you get this sort of everything collapsing to a point. Now, of course, you don't always have necessarily that the ratio of the first two values goes to, Z, goes to infinity. Uh, but as long as your sequence is non-compact, then either the ratio of the first two or the ratio of the second two or both go to infinity. And you can also see what happens. Uh, well, let me hold off on that for a moment. So uh, what's the point of this is that we again get the sort of convergence here, uh, but we need to be a little bit careful. And that is uh, so that this holds except possibly when V has zero in the first term. Because if V has zero in the first term, then when we multiply it by lambda one, this keeps a zero. So it's not getting much larger than the second vector. So we get this convergence if, V is not, um, if V is not in the span of 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. So as long as we're out of this uh, subspace, uh, then we do get this sort of collapse. Now, the nice thing about this is that this subspace has smaller dimension than the whole real projective space. So this subspace right here, uh, has a smaller dimension, in particular has zero measure if we choose a uh, harm measure. So this has measure zero. Uh, from harm measure. Harm measure being meaning any uh, quasi invariant measure that you take on this homogeneous. Uh, so that means that, again, you get this sort of picture that I've drawn over here, that for SL3 acting on projective space, as long as you have the ratio of the first two eigenvectors going to zero, then again, you take Haar measure and you collapse it to this Dirac measure right here. And the only thing that depended on in this sequence was the sequence of this case here. So of course, you don't always Dirac collapse to the same Dirac measure, but uh, you always collapse to some Dirac measure as long as these ratios go to infinity. And so what we see is we see a similar phenomenon to the rank one case with SL2, uh, except we have to hedge our bets a little bit and we can't say that for every sequence, 
we get this sort of collapsing north south dynamic, but we need that the ratio of the first two eigenvalues go to infinity. So let me explain that a bit more. Yeah, so the upshot is that if we take any sequence, gamma n, so this is n gamma, which remember, so I'm choosing gamma just because I want a discrete group. So this is a lattice in say SL3R. Uh, so then we get, oh, and if we choose, and if, um, uh, so if lambda is her measure on real projective space, so then, uh, so then if the conclusion we get is if this sequence goes to infinity, if the ratio of the eigenvectors go to infinity, so if the ratio of the first two eigenvectors or eigenvalues in the KAK decomposition uh, tend to infinity. So then we get exactly the same sort of weak star, this collapsing weak star limit as gamma n. And now we have here uh, lambda minus, and now we can take any shift of lambda because by her measure, I just mean any quasi invariant measure, so Lebesgue measure in the same class. So shifting it isn't gonna change that. And we get this as this intends to infinity is exactly equal to zero. Uh, so we still get this uh, sort of convergence property, uh, but the big thing we have to do is we have to hedge our bets here. So this is the big assumption. It's not for any sequence which tends to infinity. It's just for some special sequences that tend to infinity. Uh, so what this leads to is this leads to a notion of a properly proximal, but not properly proximal for the whole group, or properly proximal relative to like some subsequences, some appropriate subsequences. So let me give you the definition there, and we'll see what what actually comes out. So oh, I should copy this over. All right, so here's the definition which naturally comes out about this. It's really, it's like, you know, we would like to prove that this group is properly proximal, but with this natural action, this is the best we can do. So specifically, uh, so here's a definition. We'll say that a boundary piece for a group gamma is a uh, closed uh, subset X of the stone check compactification. And I want to take away the group. So really just the boundary and the stone check compactification uh, that is invariant under left and right multiplication. So left uh, and right invariant. So of course, this is just the spectrum of L infinity. So gamma acts on both the left and the right on this space. And we just ask for a closed uh, by invariant uh, subset. So this is the boundary piece. Uh, and this comes up in the previous example uh, because if we look at, uh, so if we let X be the set of all accumulation points, points uh, 
uh, of uh, these gamma n's, uh, gamma n's inside of, you know, SL3z or SL3r, wherever we are. Uh, so then this gives a boundary piece. So uh, we don't get that it's this action isn't necessarily giving us showing as properly proximal for the whole group, uh, but we'll introduce a weaker notion of proper proximality, and that's proper proximality relative to a boundary piece. And this is a natural boundary piece here. Uh, so it's not difficult to show that all the accumulation points will it'll be a closed subset. Uh, and then it's also not difficult to see that. In the KK decomposition, if the first, if the ratio of the first two eigenvalues goes to uh, infinity, then if you multiply this sequence by any fixed element of the group on the left or the right, then it still has this property. So the set of accumulation points will indeed be uh, left and right invariant here. Uh, so in the case of SL3R, this gives a natural boundary piece. And now what we can do is we can take all this. So this uh, this gives us then a notion of compact or C0 functions relative to X. So specifically, uh, we say a sequence GN tends to infinity relative to this boundary piece. Uh, if the accumulation point um, uh, is outside of this boundary piece. So if any limit point, so if any, uh, limit point, uh, hold on, what do I want to say here? No, other way around. If it tends to, if any uh, limit point is in X, which we think of inside of the stone shape magnification. So if all the limit points of GN are in X, then we say that it converges to infinity relative to X. So in the case of uh, so in the case where an X is the whole thing, then this is just saying the sequence tends to infinity. But when X is as I've described it above, this is exactly the condition that the ratio of the first two eigenvectors tends to infinity. Now, given this notion, we can then introduce the C zero functions. Relative to this boundary piece. Uh, so we can say that, that <clears throat> F is in, uh, <coughs> excuse me, F is in this uh, C0, or I'll call it this ideal X. Uh, so if the limit uh, of F of T uh, is equal to zero, whenever T tends to infinity relative to X, or take any sequence or net, I should say. Uh, so this gives a natural ideal, and L infinity is an ideal. In fact, it's indeed, it's just, uh, you can think of Ix as just the func functions, continuous functions on the stone check compactification, uh, such that they vanish on X. So that's another way to think about this ideal. And now, of course, now since before we had, uh, now we can look at the uh, functions such that when you take the right translation, they live in this ideal. So we can consider this C star algebra A, so X A, which is the set of F and L infinity of gamma, uh, such that uh, F minus the right, right translate of F lives in this ideal. And now we can say that a group is properly proximal. So here's the definition. Uh, gamma is properly proximal relative to X if there is no uh, left invariant state on the C star algebra. All right, so uh, when 
x is the whole space. So then this is exactly the usual notion we had before. All right, but as we've seen here in this example of SL3Z or any lattice in SL3R, well, this action, by looking at this action on projective space, we don't actually get that as properly proximal. Uh, we get that as properly proximal relative to this boundary piece. Uh, but now here's where a little bit of magic happens. This. So in that, uh, if we have gamma a lattice and SL3R, well, and we take its K, we take some sequence element in here or some sequence and we consider its KAK decomposition. Well, we saw that if the ratio of the first two eigenvalues uh, here tends to infinity, then we're good because we're properly proximal relative to that corresponding boundary piece. Uh, but if instead of taking the action on projective space, so the action on the space of lines in R3, if we could take the action on the space of two dimensional subspaces of R3. So we could also take the action on this uh, two dimensional Grassmannian in R3. So the action on two-dimensional subspaces. And then uh, this is, so of course, any two-dimensional subspace is uh, in bijective correspondence with the one-dimensional subspace by looking at its orthogonal complement. And so the exactly the same analysis and the same argument go through, except now if you're not looking at the ratio of the first two eigenvalues, but you're looking at the ratio of the second two eigenvalues. So if we consider this, so consider, this Grassmannian, uh, we see that gamma is properly proximal. Uh, relative to a new boundary piece, this Y, which is the set of accumulation points of GN such that uh, the ratio of the Second to second and third eigenvalues tend to infinity. So we have these two boundary pieces now. Uh, so they are not disjoint. Of course, you can have the ratios of both going to infinity, which would be the best case scenario. Uh, however, the thing to notice is that if you take any sequence which doesn't live in a compact set in SL3R, well, then either the ratio of the first two tend to infinity or the ratio of the second two tend to infinity because otherwise uh, you stay inside a compact set and we already know the Ks themselves are compact. So what we get is we get the therefore gamma is properly proximal relative to uh, boundary pieces X and why, where their union is the whole stone check compactification. So we don't get a single action uh, giving us this proper proximality, or at least not, not either of these two natural actions give us a single action. Uh, however, these two actions together kind of cover the whole group with these boundary pieces. And so then uh, what happens is you can then prove a theorem. And so I should mention in, our, in my paper with uh, Remy and Adrian, uh, so we didn't know the following theorem that I'm about to present. Uh, so we had to do all of our work by considering boundary pieces. So we had kind of a weaker notion where we said, you know, you're properly proximal relative to these boundary pieces and you're properly proximal relative to the whole thing. Uh, but fortunately, Ozawa showed us this following argument, which greatly simplifies things. So we have the following theorem, which is really due to Ozawa. 
which just says uh, that if gamma is properly proximal, relative to x and y separately, so then gamma is properly proximal uh, relative to x union y. Uh, so this is, uh, so the proof here uh, is highly non-constructive. And this is kind of uh, a little bit of a mystery. So as a corollary of this, so hence, uh, so if gamma is an SO3 R uh, a lattice, so then gamma is properly proximal. Uh, and the mystery of this is that, uh, so these two actions that we look at showing proper proximality relative to these two boundary pieces are the most natural actions you can consider for SL3R. Uh, and yet, uh, and they give you that it's properly proximal, but the action that comes out of the, the theorem, so this is a highly non-constructive theorem, it uses, um, you know, Hahn-Banach extension, uh, so, so the action that you get at in the end is some mysterious action, and I still don't know of any sort of natural action of SL3Z, which uh, realizes properly proximal directly. So it's only through this mechanism. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think for the sake of time, I'm not going to discuss the proof of this theorem. Um, but uh, the idea of the proof of this theorem is to rephrase proper proximality. So proper proximality is the existence of some sort of state uh, somewhere. And so to re you, the idea is to rephrase it in the negative as some sort of paradoxical uh, decomposition property. And then that gives you a bit more flexibility and you can use some Hanbanek in some key places. So that's, that's roughly the idea. Uh, but the nice corollary is that uh, then, uh, yeah, lattices here, and of course there's nothing special about SL3. You could work this in SLN as well, but then you'll have uh, N minus one natural boundary pieces that come from these actions on various cross monuments. Uh, the other corollary of this result uh, is that, which I mentioned last time, is that uh, properly proximal or proper, is closed under direct products. And so this is again something that if you have uh, gamma say F2 times F2 as an example, well, again, you have two natural actions. You can consider the action of, of the first copy of F2 on the boundary on its Gromov boundary you can consider the copy of the second action of F2 on the, its gramma boundary, and then you can realize these both of these actions as actions of gamma. And each of these actions will be properly proximal relative to a natural boundary piece, and these boundary pieces together, together will cover the group. So this is again a situation where we get that as properly proximal as a consequence, but again, I don't know of um, any natural action of this group which realizes this property. In fact, uh, yeah, it's, I think it's quite surprising that it's closed under products. Because if you start thinking of what, uh, you know, what this sort of action of this product group looks like, uh, you can almost convince yourself that it doesn't exist, um, but it does. Okay, so, uh, so that's uh, as far as I want to say it in terms of examples but I did want to discuss one additional non-example, which I mentioned last time. So this was this example. I wrote it down here. 
somewhere. Well, I wrote it down, but I'll tell you where it comes from. Um, so it's an example of a properly proximal group. So we already saw if their groups are interamenable, then they can't be properly proximal. Sorry, Jesse, um, you just forgot to copy and paste. Oh, yes, thank you. Yeah, thanks. There you are. Uh, so the I wanted to give an example, an example of a non-properly proximal and non-interminable. Uh, so this really shows that proper proximality is really kind of its own notion, and it's still a bit mysterious where it fits in uh, into, you know, its relationship with many other approximation properties. And this is some, some additional research is needed here. Uh, but the idea here is that I'm going to use this example of Capras. I think I wrote it down. Uh, I can't find it in my notes right now, but I wrote it down last time. So this is an example of Capras where he showed that there uh, exists a locally compact group uh, having two lattices, gamma and lambda, such that uh, gamma is interminable. and lambda is not. Uh, so this is this example I wrote down at the end of my lecture yesterday. Uh, but for time, I don't want to give this example again. Uh, but rather, I just want to state the result. Uh, so this is a theorem due to um, uh, Ishan Ishan, uh, myself, and Lauren Ruth where we show that uh, proper proximality uh, is stable under measure equivalence. So measure equivalence was discussed um, by Ishan yesterday and, and by Conrad Borbo also in his, his talk. Uh, and I'll briefly mention it in a moment. Uh, but from this result, from this theorem, then you can see exactly this result of Capras shows that there are indeed groups, uh, mainly this group uh, lambda here, where it's not interminable, but it's measure equivalent to an interminable group, and hence it's measure equivalent to a non properly proximal group, and hence it's non properly proximal itself. So this is the idea. Uh, and now to discuss the proof of this theorem, um, we actually proved this in a more general setting, which naturally came out of our proof. Uh, so let me go ahead and introduce that setting. So, uh, here's a definition, which we saw in Sean's talk yesterday. Uh, so two groups. So if, here's the first definition. So if uh, gamma uh, acts on a semi-finite von Neumann algebra with the trace-preserving uh, trace preserving action, uh, so where M is uh, semi-finite, So then a fundamental domain uh, is a projection P and M uh, 
such that if we look at, so let me call this action sigma. So such that if we look at all of these translates of this projection by uh, elements of the group, I want these to be pairwise orthogonal and that they cover the whole thing. So they give a partition of unity. So this is equal to one or equal to one. And if you're worried about convergence here, since this is an infinite sum, the convergence is in the strong operator topology uh, or, or weak operator topology. They're the same in this case because it's a positive sum, a sum of positive operators. Uh, so this is the definition of a fundamental domain. So if you're familiar with just measure theory, then this is a natural extension of this. When M is abelian, this is just co collapses to the usual notion of a fundamental domain for, for measure theory. Uh, and then given this notion of a fundamental domain, we can copy this definition, which was originally due to Gromov in the abelian case. Uh, so we can give the following definition that uh, two groups, so gamma, gamma and lambda are von Neumann equivalent. Which is kind of a mouthful to say, but if you just write a B and E, then it's, I think looks all right. Uh, they're von Neumann equivalent if there um, are trace preserving actions of uh, gamma. I want them to be commuting, so maybe there is is a trace preserving action of the product, which I can think of just commuting actions of the two groups on some semi-finite von Neumann algebra, such that gamma and lambda separately have finite trace fundamental domains. So this, this is the definition. And the remark I want to make is, uh, first of all, that if you just take this M to be abelian, so if you restrict yourself to abelian von Neumann algebras, then you get a notion which was already introduced by Gromov called measure equivalence. So that's a remark that M abelian corresponds to measure equivalence. Uh, but then there's another, this is actually a very nice setting um, uh, in that there's another natural notion, which is when the two groups have isomorphic von Neumann algebras. So here's the other remark, which Sean mentioned, but maybe I'll do a little bit more explicitly. Uh, so if we have an isomorphism, between two group von Neumann algebras. So let's call it theta. Well, as I mentioned before, if this, this is a trace preserving isomorphism, then you can identify the two L2 spaces of gamma and lambda. And so then you can consider this M, which is bounded operators on L2 of gamma, which we can identify with bounded operators on L2 of lambda, because both of these are bounded operators on L2 of L gamma, which is equal to L lambda in this case. And then you have a natural action of gamma on M, which is just, uh, let me call it sigma. So sigma gamma of T is just you conjugate by the left regular representation. So this is lambda gamma T. But we also have a natural action of lambda on this by identifying it with B of L2 of lambda, which is given by sigma lambda T is the conjugation by the right regular representation of lambda. Maybe I shouldn't use lambda since I'm already using that. So let me do this. And now this row S lives in the von Neumann algebra R 
lambda, which is equal to r gamma. And so this commutes with conjugation by the left regular representation. And then you see that if you let p be the projection onto the Dirac function at the identity, so this is a rank one projection. So this is in B of L2. It's a rank one projection. Uh, so it's finite trace. But now if you look at what is, uh, what is lambda gamma P uh, lambda gamma inverse, this is nothing but the rank one projection onto the span of the Dirac function at gamma. So in particular, these are pairwise orthogonal and they indeed sum to, to the identity. But you can do the same thing also with uh, lambda. So you have the, or with row S, P, row S. This is the rank one projection onto uh, the direct function at S. Now it should be, I should note, of course, here when I write this, this is viewing it inside of B of L2 of gamma. And when I write this, this is viewing it as inside of B of L2 of lambda. And now the, this theta gives some sort of isomorphism, natural isomorphism between these two, um, but it still gives a partition of, of the identity in both cases. So in fact, if you have isomorphic von Neumann algebras, then, then you're also von Neumann equivalent in this way. And then the theorem we actually prove The theorem that we actually prove is that if gamma and lambda are von Neumann equivalent, so then gamma is properly proximal uh, if and only if lambda is. And it was only after proving this more general theorem that, uh, so in, in particular, you get a corollary measure equivalence because of course, measure equivalence implies when I'm equivalence. Um, but the proof really came out of a non-commutative uh, situation. And um, so that's just a remark I wanted to make. We were in the end able to give a proof using only measure theory. So if you're more familiar with measure equivalence, uh, then von Neumann algebras, you can look at our paper and in, in the appendix, we do have a proof just for measure equivalence. But the proof really came out of non-commutative ideas. And that's one thing I wanna emphasize here. Uh, so what's the idea of the proof? Well, the first thing we, we need to do is uh, proper proximality or rather non-proper proximality is some sort of amenability type condition. And there are many different uh, notions, many different equivalent conditions for amenability. And so the one, and similar for, for pro proper proximality, there are a number of different uh, notions. And so the first thing we do is we translate really non-proper proximality to actions um, on Bonnock spaces. On dual Bonnock spaces. So for amenability, uh, a group is amenable if and only if for every action, isometric action on a dual Bonnock space, and for every weak star compact uh, subset, affine invariant subset, uh, there's a fixed point. So this is amenability. And there's a similar thing you can do for non-proper proximality. Uh, and actually what we need here is we don't need Bonnock spaces, but we need operator spaces. So it's even more non-commutativity. Uh, but then once you have, have that, if you have this uh, von Neumann equivalence between two groups, so I'll write it like this. If you have this von Neumann coupling between these two groups, then there's a natural way to induce an action on an operator space from lambda to gamma. So specifically, if you have uh, lambda acting on an operator space by complete isometries, so then 
what you can do is you can take just the spatial tensor product here. So this is a dual operator space. You can take the spatial tensor product here. And now you can look at the fixed points under the diagonal action of lambda here. And now you have gamma just acts on itself by just acting on M. So gamma forgets E altogether, just acts on M. But by taking the lambda fixed points in the space here, you actually get all the dynamics of the lambda action get, get passed on to gamma in this way. And so this induced, uh, you can then say this induced action shows that gamma is then not properly proximal. So there are a number of details, which uh, you know, I can't explain in full depth at the moment, but, um, uh, but this is the rough idea is that uh, using operator, some, some techniques in operator space theory, you can induce uh, completely isometric actions from lambda to gamma and then induce the properties that you need to verify non-proper proximal. Uh, okay, so thank you for your attention and I'll, I'll go ahead and end my, my talk here.